Hey. Hey, we are live. We are. If people join, that's good. Calling Chris Anderson in. I'm trying to gauge the background there. Where might you be? Another Novatel. A Novatel <laughs> in some unnamed European country. Luxembourg City. Luxembourg City. And Colin McGuire, you have a fancy new studio. I am. This, this is our Vermont studio. Wow. Uh, right the nice. Vermont headquarters of History Happy Hour. Here for yeah. a lovely fall foliage weekend. There's lovely oh, fall nice. foliage out the window there. Uh, welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And Chris and I are on the road, both on the road this weekend, but we try to reserve every time, uh, every little week, Little, 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 little time every week to join you for a cocktail and talking about history. And today we're going to talk about World War II, the whole damn thing. I mean, the whole yes. damn thing. And, and, uh, and parts of it that you've never, yep, it's all. And parts of it that you didn't even know were in World War II. Yes. Um, and uh, we want to say a big thank you to everyone supporting this effort via Patreon, especially, but not exclusively, oh, sure. but especially our top shelf oh, sure. patrons. Thank you very yeah. much. And you thank can you join very us. Much, right? We did have a few new patrons this week, no new top shelf patrons, but you can join us at patreon.com slash history happy hour and help us uh, help fund, help keep the history taps flowing. Nice. Um, and of course, you can come to our website, which Chris, we're now not just at historyhappyhour.net, we are also at historyhappyhour.com. Yeah, Big purchase, we're going high tech. We spent the eight bucks hey. and we made that happen. Thanks for looking up. Uh, so uh, who have we got out there, Chris? We uh, seem to have, well, be building a good audience already. Yeah, we've got uh, Nancy Nylands from Houston. Uh, Doreen's joined us. She's, she's off the stage and back in the audience. So welcome back, Doreen. Uh, Ken Hattrop from Kansas. Uh, Xavier from, uh, from Spain. So we have the international contingent. Lizzie Borden from London. Xavier's very excited about today's show. I see he's saying that Richard Overy is one of the greats. So it's yes. good that we have excitement there from Barcelona. There you go, exactly. Uh, David Picker and, and Jim Latin uh, from Menlo Park and all sorts of good, friendly people and people we know and people we don't know. So what do you think, Chris? Are we in a position where we can actually uh, start chugging this train out of the station? I think so. I want to tell you one thing before you give me the cue. Okay. In honor of all the awards of Nobel Prizes this week, mm -hmm. I have Nobel. Okay, you may go. <laughs> Bing. Bing, yes. Was the bar is open. Bar What's open. on tap, Chris? What do we got today? Yeah, I'm, I am so excited about uh, this week's show. Uh, joining us uh, this week is Richard Overy. Uh, Dr. Overy is a graduate of Cambridge College and a professor of history at the University of Exeter. He is a prolific author, and I mean prolific. He's written a number of definitive works uh, on the Second World War. Amongst them are Why the Allies Won, The Dictators, Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, the Morbid Age, Britain Between the World Wars, and many, many other uh, great books. And he's the recipient of a number of prestigious awards, among them uh, the Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize from the Society of Military History and the Wolfson History Prize. Um, and he is here with us this week to talk about his new book, Blood and Ruins, The Great Imperial War, 1931 to 1945. So welcome, and thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Thank Robert. you. Um, so I, with this, uh, sorry, I have to interrupt. No, go ahead. Yep, no, so uh, everybody wants to know where you are and what is your cocktail today? Well, I'm in Brescia in northern Italy, and I'm privileged to be drinking a glass of limoncello. Awesome. Very and, nice. See? And, and in honor of the leaves, Chris, I have some Oktoberfest. Wow, and I'm just going to let everybody down with a fizzy water but you've been on the road busy day later. we're gonna busy spare day. you the criticism <laughs> oh thank you um well getting right into the book because it's a big book and there's lots and lots to talk about um but let's just start with this um uh, dr over you say in the introduction to the book uh a new history of the second world war your the, the, the history of the second world war is based on four main assumptions so what are the four main assumptions that we should know about as we start this conversation on, on the book? Well, I mean, I started off 
writing this book in, in a more conventional way and I began to think about it a lot more as I went on and realized that I had to change my perspective. So I wanted to write a book that people would take an you know, interest in. Uh, I mean, the first thing is is chronology. Um, the conventional war is 1939-1945. In the States, it's really 1941-1945. to um, And I wanted to take on board all the violence of the 1930s, uh, starting with Japan's occupation of Manchuria in northern China, and so I decided I would uh, frame the war chronologically in a different way, starting in the early 1930s, uh, going on to, well, 1945. In fact, it goes beyond 1945, it goes on for the next 10 or 15 years, as the rest of the territorial empires in the world, Britain, France, and Netherlands, unraveled. So the chronology is different from the conventional chronology. The second thing I wanted to do was to emphasize how global the war was. History of the First World War is focused entirely on the Western Front, quite wrongly. Uh, the story of the Second World War is focused a lot just on Europe and the defeat of Hitler. And I wanted to write a book that was really global, to take account of the fact that the war touches you know, every, every place in the, in the world, from the Aleutian Islands to Madagascar to the Caribbean to the Middle East and so on. It's not just a war in Europe or a war you know, on the Eastern Front. It's a genuinely global war. We have to be able to account for why it is so global. The third thing I want to do was to distinguish different kinds of war, because we focus a lot on the military conflict. Right, of course, it's very important. But it also occurred to me that we needed to be able to bring in what I've called civilian wars. A lot of the victims of the Second World War were civilians, more in fact than military. Uh, civilians found themselves fighting a variety of different wars, civil defense, for example, against bombing, uh, resistance wars against occupation, uh, civil wars uh, prompted often by the, the, uh, the fact of occupation itself in, uh, in Greece, in Ukraine, in China. Uh, and so it seemed to me it was very important to write a book which paid sufficient attention to the variety of wars and particularly to the way in which civilians were involved. And the fourth thing was really to frame the whole war in an entirely novel way. I have called this the Great Imperial War. The American title actually has the Last Imperial War. But the idea was really to see this war as the end point of a long, long period of European global expansion, violent expansion most of the time, uh, after which the, the world changed, and we can come on to that perhaps later in the in the discussion. But we have to see this as a as a war for empire on the part of Japan and of Italy and of Germany, territorial empire, and a war which was initially fought by empires, the British and the French Empire in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, 1945 is about unraveling those empires, ending uh, a 500-year epoch of, uh, of European global expansion. Uh, and it seemed to me that that was the way in which we should understand the Second World War, mm -hmm. rather than the conventional way of just seeing it simply in terms of Hitler. You know, Hitler, wicked, you know, let's go to war, Hitler defeated. Uh, it's a much more complicated question than that. Yeah. So one of the things that you write, uh, sort of following up on that theme that Chris started, uh, you say the Second World War was a result of decisions taken in London and Paris, not Berlin. And then you say that Hitler, Mussolini, the Japanese you know, military are not causes of the war, but rather effects of the war, which is a really uh, a kind of a provocative uh, way to look at it a little bit, isn't it? It is. I mean, you know, it's, if you like, it's deliberately provocative. Um, but we focus so much on, on Mussolini, Hitler, and the Japanese military, we say it's, you know, it's their fault. You know, there was a stable world, and here they came and messed it all up. And I'm arguing that if you look at the period from before the First World War, look at the First World War and its aftermath, look at the problems of the 1920s and then the economic crash in 1929, 1932, you know, this is a world in crisis. Uh, Hitler, Mussolini and the Japanese uh, militarists uh, 
are in a sense uh, a consequence of that broader crisis rather than its cause. And I, I, I don't, I mean, you know, I think once you think about it, you see that that's that's the way around. Doesn't mean that doesn't mean that they're not responsible, because of course they are, but they're reacting to a situation. Uh, and we need to understand what that situation is. And when it comes to 1939, you know, Hitler didn't want to fight the British and the French at that point. He hoped he could get away without fighting anybody for a while. Um, and it was the British and the French who finally said, enough. You know, your imperial project is too dangerous for us. We're going to stop you. Um, and, you know, that was the point at which the war became, you know, more genuinely a global war. And so, you know, picking up on, on the idea of empire, you, you know, you talk about Britain and France um, being the big imperial powers um, at the start of this whole process, but then you have uh, Germany, Japan, and Italy kind of striving for their, for their own empires. What, what was different about, or was there anything different about, you know, their aims and what, the, what we call the Axis powers brought to the, to the race for empire? I mean, how were, was, this, was it a new thing or were they... You know, following the same playbook, I guess you'd say. Well, they were very imitative. They were looking back at the period of violent imperialism, which began roughly in the 1870s, whether it's Africa, the Middle East, Asia. Uh, this is a, a period in which all, all the powers scramble for territory. And the British and the French and the Dutch already have advantages over the Germans and Italians and, uh, and the Japanese, but they're all out there trying to get territory, control over resources, strategic uh, outposts, global strategic outposts and so on. And in the 1920s, uh, that reaches in some ways its apogee because the British and the French empires become larger than ever with the acquisition of territories in 1919. And the Germans and the Italians and the, and the Japanese particularly feel resentful that they've been left out, you know, that they are not the powers they ought to be, because they saw themselves as great powers, you know, get, you know with a civilizing mission, if you like, mm -hmm. and they didn't see why they shouldn't have a, a slice of empire as well. And so the 1930s is really about that. It's about, you know, rectifying their position so that they uh, can be imperial powers like the British or the, the French. Um, echoing a process which has gone on for 50 years. Mm -hmm. There were two things that uh, I was struck by kind of in relation to that, uh, that kind of quest for empire uh, on the part of those countries. And, and one is um, sort of the, the idea of, of uh, imperial fantasies, I think is the phrase you use, that they, they all three uh, sort of in different ways thought that they were going to get uh, great wealth and benefits from these empires, which, which did not exactly work out that way. And the, the second part, the second thing, you know, that just had never really occurred to me is that in, in, especially for Japan, and maybe to a lesser extent for Italy and then lesser for Germany, they, by the time the allies are involved in the war, they've already suffered a lot of losses, troop losses and resource losses. I think, I think if I remember correctly, Japan had already lost something like 180,000 soldiers against, yeah. uh, against China. So this idea of empire, like they wanted to get in on the good thing, but it wasn't that good. Yeah, exactly, precisely. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the term I, I use is fantasy empires. It's a term used by, by a German historian, Peter Kundras, uh, describing the delusion that somehow empire is going to be good for you. Uh, of course, they looked to Britain and France and the British and the French, you know, controlled, you know, more than a third of the globe. Uh, and they were rich because they were imperial powers. And so they assumed that somehow or other you could do the same thing. Um, but the difference from the 1930s is that the countries you choose to attack are all sovereign nations, members of the League of Nations. You know, it's not like the 1870s and 1880s where you push your way into Asia and Africa into societies that you regard as second class or uncivilized and so on, and you use force to take them over. These are existing nation states, and you have to pretend that China or Eastern Europe or later on Russia uh, or you know, Ethiopia, you have to pretend that this is really colonial space, and that you can make your, 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 you know, your empire there. You can't. It costs a lot. It costs a lot in manpower. Uh, it costs a huge amount um, in, in simply pacifying the areas that you've taken over. 
Empire always was difficult, even before 1914. It was costly, often more costly than the advantages you got from it. But these three states never really learned that lesson. They assumed that you could just march out there and eventually the riches would come. They didn't. Well, well you know, and, and I guess I just wanted to ask you, especially that period between the wars, um, you know, obviously the, the, the Great War, World War One, had been fought. Um, lots of empire hung up during that war. Um, was anybody in the 30s, wait a minute, there's another way to assert great power status beyond creating these empires. Sorry, you broke up a bit then. I couldn't quite hear. Oh. Well, I, I mean, who was, I started saying well, between the wars, um, who was saying maybe a different way, there are different ways to assert great power status other than building an empire? Um, yeah, I mean, just finished the first book. Well, they were. Of course, I think we need to remember that the 1930s is a period of real crisis. The crisis is, is economic at root. Uh, the German and Japanese communists were deeply affected by the slump. It's going to be, take a long time to drag themselves back. Um, and they were almost entirely convinced that the British, the French, and Americans in particular, of course, would be opposed to reintegrating them into a world economy in which they could, they could benefit. Though, of course, that was in fact the answer. And after 1945, that's exactly what happened. But, now, they assumed that the, that the old world had come to an end. The liberal global economy, capitalist economy, uh, the current geopolitical balance of power. They thought that had come to an end and that they could remodel the world in ways which suited them. And that meant building a territorial and economic bloc which they could dominate and which would satisfy the requirements of their home population, would raise their living standards, would make them less dependent on the Western world. Um, and I mean, we know now, looking at it, that it's a delusion, of course, but at the time, I think, you know, the circles that favoured imperialism really thought that that was a possibility. In fact, it was the only possibility uh, to maintain their status as great powers. I said the irony is that after 1945, Italy, Germany and Japan embarked on their own extraordinary economic miracle. Very good, no time at all, Germany and Japan became economic superpowers. Uh, their politics stabilized, and you know, there was another way of doing it, uh, and not the way they chose in the 1930s. You know, one of the things that's, that uh, I want to remind everybody that we're talking to Richard Overy, who is the author of uh, Blood and Ruins, his, his latest book, which is um, has been described as a, a single volume history of World War II, and it's not simply a, a history, but also kind of a a little bit of a, of a rumination and an exploration, um, because you don't really. Uh, I think traditionally, when people think of the the war, they think of the the armies and the military, or they think of even the countries um, involved. And what really struck me is that you are really looking at the people, the peoples of the entire globe. What what happens when the entire globe goes to a war footing? And what are the consequences of that that are emotional, economic, social, everything? I mean, this is a, a it, to me, it was a really eye-opening and different way uh, to look at that war. I don't have a question per se about it, except to say what, you know, why was that important to you to do that? And, 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 and did you feel you were able to, to cover the war and get a new perspective on the war by doing that? Yes, I mean, it was very important to do it. I mean, the first part of the book, of course, provides an analytical narrative of the campaigns. Um, but, you know, it seemed to me to be able to produce a, a history of the Second World War, which covered the whole experience, you know, what happens to people in the event of war. Uh, you, you need to look at everything, you know, mobilization, economic performance, uh, civilian wars, as I've already described, um, the emotional impact of war. And that's, I think, you know, one of the chapters I enjoyed writing most, well, it's not enjoyable, but, uh, you know, I found most stimulating is really just to examine, you know, what, what, the, what the war did to largely civilian armies, you know, these largely conscripts from civilian life, put into uniform, made to go off and kill each other. You know, what does that mean? 
Uh, and what does it mean to the people who are being bombed on the ground? You know, what does that mean? How do cities survive you know, under the impact of bombing? And, you know, you can't do a, a global history of the Second World War without looking at it in that, that broader frame. You know, so many of the earlier histories of the Second World War, which were very good as military histories, but, I mean, basically it was about armies moving here and there, ships moving here and there, divisions being moved on the map and so on. You know, the warfare is much more than that. Chris, can I do a follow-up on that? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, uh, in, in talking about your, your chapter on the um, what you call the emotional geography of the war, uh, uh, you had a quote um, uh, from a survivor of the Siege of Leningrad, death has become a phenomenon observable at every turn. People are, um, you know, are, are apathetic. The feeling of pity has vanished. No one cares. Uh, and, 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 and I thought it was interesting. You talked about the civilians who are like in Leningrad who are under siege, but the civilians in the who are have become infantrymen and who you say probably 80, I think I'm throwing out a number, this is not exact, but something like 80 percent of people who who served in the infantry probably ended up with PTSD of some kind or another. And I just think I just thought it was a really interesting to to approach the war from that emotional point of view. It's just something I hadn't really considered, you know, beyond an individual here or there. Well, I think it's very important. It's also a reminder of what war does. You know, I mean, I had hoped that one of the things this book would do would be to remind Europeans, Americans, uh, you know, Japanese, you know, the cost of war, what war really actually does to the people involved in it. Uh, and yet here we are again, you know, with war in the Ukraine. You know, people don't learn or don't remember. Um, but the, the cost of war emotionally is uh, it's enormous for those who are you know, waiting at home for news, for those who are being besieged, for those who are being bombed, uh, to people in the in the front line. And, and there's no doubt, for, you know, for ordinary soldiers, this is a traumatic experience. 25% um, psychiatric casualty rate for the American and Canadian armies and so on when they first came into combat in Europe in, in 1944. Uh, in Britain, the level was slightly low, but, I mean, it's still... You know, you know, very high level, you know, a fifth or a quarter of people become psychiatric casualties. And most of them can't be returned to combat uh, because, you know, once once it's once you've broken down, it's very difficult to be persuaded that, you know, actually you can go back. They go back, they often go back to non-combatant roles. It was only on the Eastern Front or in China that you had, you, you know, you still have the same trauma, but people were not really allowed to break down the you know, Japanese had almost no psychiatric care for their soldiers. You know, if you broke down, you know, I don't know, you shot yourself or something. But but otherwise, they you know they expected the Japanese soldier to carry on, and the Soviet Union too. You know, no concept of you know really of psychiatric breakdown. Those who broke down, deserted, ran away, cried, were terrified, and so on. You know, often end up with a bullet in the back of the head. Mm. So um. One, God, there's so much here to, to t talk about. Um, so I know these might question might seem a bit random, but there's there's just so much that's interesting. Um, there's a passage that you have in here that I'd kind of like to get your comment on, um, moving away from what Rick was asking you about. But this says, you say, from the imperial world, uh, both old and new, the shadows of Lenin and Wilson stalked their ambitions. What, what do you mean by the, the shadows of Lenin and Wilson? Well, 1919 was a very important year, and it was the, the, the year, of course, that the, the Bolsheviks became more established in Russia, and um, the common term was founded, committed to anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism. Um, Wilson, too, was, uh, you know, an anti-imperialist who found it very difficult to unravel the empires, uh, and in fact became you know, more and more sympathetic to the British and French position than he should have been. Um, but nonetheless, the idea that somehow, you know, American high politics represented something different from empire, uh, and Soviet high politics obviously represented something different from, from empire. Uh, in the 1930s, you know, for, for the states embarking on a new wave of imperialism, they were always looking over their shoulder. What will the Soviet Union do? What will the United States do? I think I make a point in the book that for all three powers, they thought there was a brief window of opportunity. They would 
push their way through it quickly in the 1930s while the russians were too busy modernizing their economy while the americans were isolationist they would establish their territorial empires oh, and then they would turn around and say well what are you going to do about it uh, but they were always worried that the Soviet Union and the United States might uh, uh, object. And then they do. The Soviet Union becomes a threat in Eastern Europe. America starts to uh, sanction Japan. And so the Japanese and the Germans decide that the only way they can cope and build their empires is actually to have to fight the Soviet Union and the United States. And that, of course, as you know, was more or less the end of the story. Yeah. Um. I share Chris's apology for ping-ponging you around uh, your book a little bit, um, uh, but we, we want to um, uh, try to cover some, uh, some of the questions we have, and then hopefully we'll be able to bring in some questions from our audience uh, later on. And a few people have been asking about uh, comparisons with Ukraine, and I think we're going to try to save that for a little later in the show. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Holocaust and how you dealt with that in the book. Are you right that for Hitler, the war and the subsequent steps to Jewish annihilation were inseparable from his war effort and his war aims? Uh, <coughs> can you expand a little bit uh, uh, on that and your take of how the Holocaust fits into your uh, sort of war of empires thesis and perspective? Yes. Well, I mean, the Holocaust is not something which affected you know, the Japanese, the Italians. The Italians had anti-Semitism. The Japanese paid a bit of lip service to what the Germans were doing. But the Holocaust is a unique phenomenon of, Germ of German imperialism during this period. Uh, and it stems from two things, I think, chiefly. The first is that Hitler had for a long, long time um, accepted the geopolitical fantasy that the Jews somehow were a large, powerful international organization that challenged countries like Germany and would undermine them. Uh, and the idea of this world Jewish conspiracy uh, was consistent really through Hitler's thinking. So you, f you find when war breaks out in September 1939, the first thing he says when he notices uh, war to the German people is that the Jews have been manipulating in you know, Paris and London and have, have pushed the uh, Western powers into war, which they didn't want. You know, when Roosevelt becomes difficult in 1941, uh, war is looming. Uh, again, Hitler's view entirely is that this is Jews in Washington who are manipulating Roosevelt. He's surrounded by Jews and, you know, and what would you expect? Jews in Moscow and Washington and London are you know, all conniving together to strangle Germany's birthright. Uh, now, it's an extraordinary fantasy, and anybody in Germany with a, you know, an inkling of intelligence would recognize what nonsense this was. Um, but many Germans didn't. Many Germans went along with that fantasy uh, and joined Hitler with that fantasy. The second thing is that, that the area that Hitler chose for German Empire, Central and Eastern Europe and Eurasia, is full of Jews, is where most of Europe's Jews live, where most of the world's Jews lived. Uh, and Hitler seems to have been very, I mean, strange actually for an Austrian, uh, you know, the Austrian Empire had large Jewish communities, but he seems never to have really considered this, taking over Austria, then taking over Czechoslovakia, then taking over more than half of Poland, then eventually, of course, attacking the Soviet Union. What do you do? You bring millions and millions and millions of Jews into your imperial area. And yet the Jews are the enemy of Germany. You know, the Jews are the world enemy. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you expel them all, hopefully to the Urals, beyond, into Siberia, where they'll all die. Uh, but once that becomes clear, you can't do that. What do you do? You eradicate them. Uh, it, you know, it's the most extreme form, if you like, of imperial genocide. There have been genocides, you know, in the 19th century uh, as well, but nothing like this. You know, it, it, what Hitler wanted, and what Himmler and the others with, working with Hitler wanted was a Jew-free empire. It didn't make sense to them to have a German empire and then have it full of Jews. Uh, and, and as a result, you set out to eliminate them. First of all, by killing them and putting them in big pits um, with, by firing squad. Uh, and then, of course, in the extermination camps. But one way or another, what Hitler wanted and his entourage wanted was a Jew-free empire. Well, and, and, and picking up on that, uh, Dr. Overy, is there something about the nature of the war or the, imper uh, the imperial component of the war uh, 
that led to it being so vicious because it is it's the Holocaust, but there's brutality against civilians on a scale that is really unsurpassed at this point. Is it something about that cry for empire that causes this, or where do you think that comes from? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Yeah, no, this is about the drive to empire. I think I make the point in the book that that that, that you know much of the atrocity, whether it's in Ethiopia or whether it's in China or South, um, you know, or, or Southeast Asia, um, perpetrated by the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese, and so on, is because they they treat this as colonial territory, and they think that you know you can treat colonial peoples differently, as as everybody did before 1914. Um, and that meant not just that they were second-class citizens, subjects, not citizens, but it also meant that you could repress them with an extreme level of violence. Um, and so what you have is, you know, written large, if you like, uh, a, a, a typical colonial experience. You know, you want to pacify the area, and if everybody accepted that, that's fine, but when they don't, then you have to use extreme forms of repression. And we have to say that after the Second World War, when the British and the French and the Dutch were trying to save their empires uh, in Malaya, in Kenya, in Algeria, in Indonesia, they used an extreme level of violence, also atrocities, torture, and so on. Um, and, and, and in a way, that's that's the same kind of process. You know, you can treat colonial peoples differently from the way in which you would treat people. Uh, in the developed world. And following up on Chris's comment, I mean, one of the things that I was kind of struck dumb by reading uh, was the scale of the Holocaust. And uh, and we want to thank Richard for joining us when he is suffering from a from a cold here. We're, we're really kind of torturing him <laughs> late at night, forcing him to stay up and talk to us and, and deal with that. Um, uh, so we appreciate your being here. Um, but the scale of the Holocaust is horrific. But you talk about the Germans' economic plans, uh, which had they been carried out and had they been victorious, they might have resulted in in a, a extermination of uh, of maybe 50 million people in yeah. uh, in the Soviet Union and the areas that they wanted to turn into the Greater German Empire. It could have yes. been is is horrible, and it could have been even more horrible. It could. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. In fact, I mean, Jews were the principal target because it just didn't make sense to have a you know a German Empire full of Jews. Uh, but the idea was just that you know there wasn't room for all the Slavs, and the Slavs would have to move east, uh, where they might perish in Siberia, um, or they might just starve to death. Um, you know, the idea was that you remodel this entire area biologically to favour the Germans, and you know if that meant the loss of thirty million people. Uh, well, so be it. The same thing is true, really, in, in you know Japan's war in China, although it was less planned than the German uh, ethnic cleansing. You know, for the for the Japanese too, you know, the, the, the it didn't matter how many Chinese died. Uh, you you know, you needed areas for Japanese settlement too, um, and you know, in the end, uh, an estimated. 12, 15 million Chinese died. So these are huge figures, you know, you compare it with the Holocaust, 6 million, but you know, millions and millions of Chinese died, millions of Russians died too. And, and, and as these empires, these powers are trying to expand into empire, do, do, do they have a central plan? I mean, do they have a, this is ultimately what we want, or this is the end state, or are they just kind of stumbling along and, you know, the, and taking what they can get, but I mean, you know, what what we the older histories of World War II are always like. Well, they were planning on world domination. Yeah. Um, is that a central plan, or are they just kind of seeing what they can get away with? Or yeah, no, it's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. You know, it's opportunistic because they they don't know what they can get away with, and the more they get away with, the more they want. So that uh, you know, Mussolini is very cautious before going to Ethiopia. Once he's conquered it. Uh, then, you know, intervention in Spain, taking over Albania, thinking about conquering Egypt and Sudan and so on. So the more you get, and, the, you know, the failure of anybody to stop you, you know, the more you th think you can get. Um, so there's no clear central plan. 
But once they're established, you know, uh, Japanese Empire in China and Southeast Asia and the Pacific, the German Empire stretching right into uh, into Russia to Eurasia, then you do begin to get some central planning. You know, the famous General Plan East, which is drawn up for the ethnic remodeling of the of the East, the construction really of the German dominated empire. Uh, the Japanese too begin to think in terms of a of a larger area, the so called co prosperity sphere, you know, in which everyone, you know, every country will have an you know an allotted place and so on, and the Japanese will, you know, create institutions for dominating the, the region. Uh, only the Italians can't do that really because uh, you know the, the Italian Empire in, in Africa is defeated very quickly. Uh, the Italians are driven out of Africa. Uh, they have uh, uh, of course control of part of Greece and part of Yugoslavia, but there's not really a structure there to allow them to develop any real imperial vision. But the Germans and Japanese, are, I mean, the strange paradox is that, you know, you're fighting a major war now against the major powers of the world, and yet somehow or other you think the empire will survive. So you go yeah. on building its institutions, constructing its economy and so on, and the assumption that somehow or other, you know, they'll win, and the other powers will have to accept that there is now a Japanese empire and a German empire. You know, I mean, delusion to start with, a delusion sustained, I think, throughout the uh, period of war itself. Yeah. So, uh, Richard, we have a question from one of our viewers, uh, Lynn Hargrove, who asks, would you say that the roots of both world wars can be found in the Napoleonic Wars? So just when you thought we were going to be getting ready to focus on today and Putin and Russia. No, let's go back to Napoleon. And, and how much can we blame him for this? Well, I mean, I've been asked this question before. Um, I mean, I think my problem really is there's just too much time and too many historical developments that separate the era of the World Wars from what happens in the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, we have a, a vision of the Napoleonic Wars now that they are much more global and much more total perhaps than historians used to think uh, but there's in my mind too much water under the bridge by the time we get to the late 19th century and the new wave of uh, imperialism um in fact if, you know if if napoleon contributed anything it was you know to contribute to the modernization of europe um to you know shifting you know european traditions a great deal opening the way to uh, a more modern age, um, but that doesn't anticipate, I think, the great wave of violent empire building from the 1870s onwards, because you know, much of that is associated with the new phenomena, the rise of mass politics, the rise of industrialization, uh, the development of modern nationalism and so on. Um, and you could date some of those back to the late 18th century, but I, I don't think it's helpful to do so. And I think we're looking at a distinct phenomenon from the 1870s through to the 1940s. Uh, and so in, in terms of the war, uh, one of the questions that I always have asked myself as I read about the war, and I very much like to get your thoughts, you have uh, the three axis powers and they're trying to build their empires. Clearly, um, you know, they find themselves at war with m most of the rest of the major powers in the world. They're, given their situation, there seems to be very little coordination between these three empires, or these empire builders, I guess you would say. Um, yeah. Why do you think there is that is why why wasn't there more coordination? Yes, I mean you would expect there to be much more. I mean historians recently, uh, uh, global historians recently, um, have begun to to find links between the three that we've ignored perhaps in the past, uh, uh, but they're still very limited, you know, with economic mm -hmm. aid or whatever it is, compared with what the United States is giving to the Soviet Union or the British Empire, uh, or the British Empire is, is, is giving to um, you know, uh, other parts of the world. Um, I mean, part of the problem is geographical. It's very difficult to see how they can help each other, particularly once Japan is bogged down in the Pacific and Germany is bogged down in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, Italy would have liked more help uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but gets extremely limited help. Uh, you know, rubble in the desert, but two divisions. You know. um, it, it is a difficult question to answer. I think it's partly, 
they're just partly geographical, partly that these are all relatively weak economies compared, for example, with the United States and later on the Soviet Union. So there's not a lot they can give each other. You know, the Italians are asking the Germans all the time, more coal, please, more steel, please. And this, you know, Germans say, no, you know, we need coal and steel to fund our own war effort. Mm -hmm. uh, the big difference with the Allies is that the Allies have control of the seas. So they can move around wherever they want. I mean, you know, submarines are interrupted, but, but more or less, uh, Britain and later on the United States uh, have control of global communications. And that's a big, big help, both in terms of logistics, providing assistance to, uh, to distant areas, uh, being able to move troops around where you want to move troops around, being able to conduct your trade you know, without um, uh, uh, serious problems. Um, and, uh, and that meant that collaboration was possible. You could feed the Soviet war machine without the, without the Axis being able to, to interrupt you. Mm. America could, feel, could feed the British Empire uh, without it being interrupted too seriously, and, and that's a big contrast, I think, between the between the two sides. Chris, I was wondering if you wanted to ask another uh, World War II <laughs> based question before we, we we devote a little time to comparisons with uh, with Ukraine and and today. Well, I would I would just um, <coughs> you know, one one question. I mean, some, it maybe seem sort of obvious, but we've talked about how this drive for empire, you know, leads to war. Um, but how does this drive for empire affect the actual conduct of the war? I know you touched a little bit about on, you know, say the relationship between Great Britain and the United States, obviously two that have two different attitudes towards empire um, might be one avenue, but how does just an empire driven war affect how the war ends up being fought. I mean, it, well, it does for a very obvious reason, because, you know, the sites of, of the conflict are in uh, you know, Eastern Europe, Mediterranean, the Middle East, uh, China and the Pacific. Um, uh, and the, the only thing that unites the allies together uh, is the idea that you end the territorial claims of these three states. And they are territorial claims, you know, the Germans, so Japanese are not going to give up territory. They have to be pushed off it. Uh, so the strategy of the of the Allied powers is always dictated by the desire to end the imperial projects of Italy, Japan, and Germany. And that's the priority. It's the only thing that unites them, actually, because otherwise there are big differences between the Allied powers from yeah. one reason or another. Um, Empire matters, of course, for the British, uh, for the very obvious reason that the British Empire gives the motherland a great deal of assistance. Often played down, I think, in many of the histories, but it's absolutely you know essential. In the Pacific, it's you know Australians. In the Middle East, it's uh, Indian soldiers and New Zealanders and South Africans, uh, Canadians. Uh, in Italy, it's Canadians. You know, not in D-Day, it's Canadians, um, and that's something which is always overlooked. You know, the British do fight an imperial war. Um, we see Americans don't, of course, nor the Soviet Union. They do fight an imperial war because, you know, without the support of the empire, the British war effort would have been much reduced. Yeah. So we have a lot of audience questions, uh, uh, no surprise, bringing up uh, the modern day conflict uh, in Ukraine. And I know this is a, a topic that you have uh, got from uh, folks before. I think one, you know, one way the question is phrased is from Jin Latin who asks, is the war in Ukraine not also an imperial war? And a couple of other people have phrased that in similar ways. Is, is what Putin is doing, is that uh, an imperial war? And the second uh, thing I would bring up in connection with that is someone uh, uh, who asks, are there parallels between Hitler's beliefs and behavior in the 30s and 40s and those of Putin today? So I'll put those two questions out there and you can deal with them and other comparison issues of this as you wish. I mean, for me, it's always a problem because, you know, we're talking about uh, 80 years later and conditions change a lot, geopolitical conditions change a lot, um, politics changes a lot. Um, you know, what Putin's ambitions in the Ukraine are, are not imperial in the sense in which I was talking about empire before, in which people become subjects. 
uh, in which they're exploited. We say labor power is used almost like slave labor. Uh, you know, Putin's idea is that somehow or other the areas in Ukraine he takes over are inhabited by Russians and Russian speakers who will be happy to be part of Russia. They'll be Russian citizens. In fact, they'll all be Russian citizens, but whether they like it or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, and you, you know, they're not, it's not there, it, it, they're not conquering the areas in order to exploit them. They will take economic advantage of, of, from them, but exploit them in a way in which, you know, African or Asian colonies were exploited by the European powers before 1939. So there's a superficial similarity, but I think it's uh, it's a bit dangerous to simply see it as imperialism. Maybe it's more complex. It's a more complex problem than that. Um, are there similarities with Hitler? Well, there are similarities. You know, Putin's excuses that, you know, he's attacked Ukraine because of irredentism, because of the Russians who are being persecuted by Ukrainians, just as Hitler you know, attacked Poland because he said there were Germans who were being persecuted by Poles. Uh, but I think we need to be cautious about coincidences. You know, I, I think that the, the situation in the 2020s is very different to the situation of the 1930s. Um, and I think there's a lot of harking back. You know, is he Stalin? Is he Hitler? And so on and so on. Is this empire building? And I think that that we need to treat it in terms of the 2020s, not in terms of the 1930s. In the 2020s, you know, this is um, uh, Putin, an authoritarian, almost dictatorial figure now, uh, anxious about his domestic um, popularity, uh, fed up with what Ukraine is doing, insecure at what he sees as a threat from NATO, uh, and reacting accordingly. Uh, and these are all conditions dictated by, you know, the post-Cold War era, not dictated by the 1930s. So any more on Russia, Rick, or are we going to... Well, I mean, I think that the, you know, his comments kind of broadly cover the, the questions that have been, that have been brought up. I mean, uh, so... Well, I, I've been, I mean, I've been um, asked, you know, many times about Soviet imperialism, and there are, there are, I mean, there's a strong strain of anti-Sovietism still out there, in the sense that that Stalin was the imperialist too. I think that in 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 that case, you know, the imperialist in Poland, in the Baltic states, and so on. Um, but I think in that case, it's it's misleading because you know Stalin wants to extend Soviet power when he can, but he wants to extend Soviet power because he's a communist, and he wants areas to become communist. He wants to liberate the workers and peasants. Of course, there's not much of a liberation in our, you know, from our point of view, but, you know, the, 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 the ambitions that he has is to spread communism where it is possible to spread it. And Hitler you know, openly invites him to push into Eastern Europe under the terms of the Nazi-Soviet pact. And what does he do? He starts setting up communist administration straight away, uh, sending all the capitalists and nationalists and kulaks off to the gulag. Um, and I think we're, you know, we're in danger again of confusing the two things. You know, for, for, for Stalin, the priority is that eventually the world will become communist. And the more you can take bits of territory and turn them communist, the better. That's what he does. So kind of picking up on um, Stalin a bit, uh, the other one of the fascinating things that you kind of delve into in the book is the question of just war and good war and, and how... Um, there's a lot of gray in history and not necessarily black and white. Um, and it, you, you give lots of examples of that, but I, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the, the allies position to be, you know, in an alliance with Stalin fighting fascism uh, you know, when, when Stalin is, is probably not somebody you want to invite over for Christmas dinner. Um, and, and likewise, you know, the British Empire has its own record of, of being less than kind to its subject people. How do they how do they square that? You know, you have a wonderful quote from, you know, say from W.B. Du Bois, where he says there's no Nazi atrocity, which the Christian civilizations of Europe had not long been practicing against colored folks in all parts of the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, how how is how are people squaring that? Yes. Yeah, so it's a strange alliance. There's no question. It's a strange alliance. 
I mean, they are, as I said before, I think, committed entirely to eradicating uh, these new empires. Um, and much of it is expressed in terms of anti-fascism, uh, particularly anti-Hitlerism, which is the most powerful sentiment, I think, in, uh, in the West and in the Soviet Union. Um, and that's how they hold themselves together. But for the Britain and the United States, collaborating with Stalin is not easy, because for two years before, you know, they've almost regarded Stalin as an ally of Hitler, and, you know, as, as bad as, you know, two dictators as bad as each other. Suddenly, you know, Stalin is holding up German armed forces. And, you know, as long as he does that, uh, you know, then you, you just swallow hard and say, oh, well, the Soviet Union is not a very nice place. We know that for all kinds of reasons. Uh, the public quite likes the Soviet Union because it regards it as a progressive country and so on, as the propaganda suggests. Um, you know, therefore, we, you know, we stick together. But as soon as you've reached the point where the Axis states are clearly about to be defeated, uh, then that glue begin, begins to become unstuck, actually, quite quickly. Um, and people, as some of them, is very keen, I'd say, well, you know, there was plenty of potential, they could have collaborated and so on and so on. Not until 1947, 48, that, you know, you're really into this crisis. But it's not true. It's already there in 1944 and 45. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult for the British and the Americans to live with the Soviet Union once it's invaded Eastern Europe. Uh, they swallow hard because they don't want, you know, the public worldwide to see rifts in the alliance, but the rifts are already developing. I wonder, uh, you've written a book that really dives into every corner of World War II, um, and you know, World War II is a topic that's been explored endlessly in a, in a, a, a thousand or 10,000 books and documentaries and seminars and movies. You know, writing this book, where does it leave you uh, in terms of your understanding of World War II? Did it, did it, did you feel it changed your understanding? You know, did you feel there was something, you know, like one thing or one main thing that you took away that, that, that kind of uh, just made it make a lot more sense uh, uh, when you were done with it that, that you didn't feel at the beginning of it? Well, I didn't feel it at the beginning because, you know, I wasn't quite sure how to approach the book and I started writing it rather differently and had to stop and jettison quite a lot um, because I was you know, very impressed by the great wealth of imperial and global history written in the last 10 or 15 years, which is forcing us to think about the Second World War in a different context. And that's what I began to do. And that's what I've done in the book. But, um, and coming away from the book, I'm glad I wrote it that way. I mean, I think it, it I mean, f to my mind, it makes, it makes much more sense of a great deal of what's happening in the 1930s and 1940s. It also means that you can link what happens also much earlier with what happens in the Second World War. It also means that 1945 is not the end point, uh, although that's the date on my cover. You know, the end point comes in the 1960s with the end of the Algerian War and the independence of you know, most of colonial Africa and so on. You know, there's a long period of a violent withdrawal from empire, and it meant that you could put that in too, whereas most histories of the Second World War simply talk about, you know, 1945, Nuremberg trials, displaced persons, um, the onset of the Cold War, and so on, uh, without ever really putting it into that broader global context. I, mean, I think if I took one thing away that struck me as important, and, and I began to talk about it more in the book, I think, than I would have done, of course, is that, you know, where does the Chinese superpower begin? We have a Chinese superpower now. Um, and for Chinese historians, you know, <laughs> The roots of that are in the 1930s and 40s, you know, the onset of the Civil War, the conflict with the Japanese, the triumph of Mao Zedong in, uh, in 1949, um, which paved the way for creating what is now you know, the Chinese superpower. Um, and that's, you know, of all the changes which occurred after 1945, that's perhaps the most significant geopolitically. Um, and I think that that's something I've taken away from the book on thinking more about it. I might even perhaps have added more about the Chinese war than I have in the book. So, you know, picking up on, on what 
um, Rick had asked, when I read this book, there were just so many moments that I was like, now I understand the war so much better and, and things that I had questioned seem to make sense. Um, why do you think it took so long for this kind of interpretation of the event to even be considered? You know, when I first saw the book cover in Imperial War, I thought, what? what? No, you know. Yeah. Um, but then I read it, it makes perfect sense. And why do you think that this hadn't popped up in thought up until you wrote the book? Well, I think historians tend to work in compartments, and I think for a long time this was military history with, you know, capital M and capital H, to which a lot of, his, lot of historians, academic historians, are prejudiced against military history. So the military history had its own trajectory, talking about the military, mm -hmm. and about so battles and about how they were won. Uh, and it, it's, it's only once you begin to move out from that and begin to take over the material written by social historians, cultural historians, global historians, or most importantly, in this case, imperial historians, that you break down the barriers between those different compartments and, and you can come up with a thesis which integrates these different approaches rather than seeing them simply as, as separate. Historians can be, I mean, like, you know, like many scientists, you know, can, can be very protective of their frontiers and don't tend to think a lot outside them. And I think that to understand the Second World War fully, you've got to be willing to think outside the box. And I, I hope that's what I've done with this book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Richard Overy, thank you so much for joining us today on History Happy Hour and fighting off your cold with the limoncello. And uh, uh, we appreciate that. We want to remind everybody that your new book is Blood and Ruins, The Last Imperial War. 1931 to 1945. It is a big book. It is terrific. So you really should Absolutely. take a look at it. And uh, all of the rave reviews that you've gotten, uh, I think it lives up to, to every one of them. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank, thank you very so much. much. My pleasure. Thank you. And Chris, we have, um, we have an encore episode next week. Yes, we do. It's a surprise. <laughs> it's a surprise that means it's we still surprise. have to talk about it. It's a surprise it. because we haven't picked it yet. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'll be on the road. And unlike you, I'm just not bold enough to do um, uh, History Happy Hour during my tour since it is a, I'll be on a Revolutionary War tour. So it would come in the middle of the day and it kind of doesn't work out. But uh, okay. you can, we'll be, we'll be on encore shows for two weeks and then we'll be back with live shows. We have a bunch of great shows. We'll send, be sending out a newsletter this week. We have a bunch of great shows coming up between now and, uh, and the, end of, uh, the end of the year. So we're really looking forward to, to for, seeing yes, you guys for all those shows. Lots to talk about, lots of books to read. Good stuff. You can find out about it all, of course, on our website, which is historyhappyhour.com or net, either one. I want to thank Cheryl Del Pozo for uh, booking this interview and so many others. Where would we be? We'd just be talking to ourselves without Cheryl there. So um, we're sure. really glad that that's not happening. And thanks all for being with us and, and keep, uh, keep living and learning. Thanks, everyone. Be safe.